Kasselelie, Noea, glad you could join us on the Pacific Way. With the fast-changing world of science and technology, disease incursions can occur quite unexpectedly. While the region is free from a lot of the major animal health diseases that spread and affect other areas of the world, there is still fear that they will spread. The Animal Health and Production Team at the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, or SBC, works together with national government agencies and interested parties in the Pacific region to develop prosperous, efficient and sustainable animal health and production systems. This short documentary talks about the key to handling disease surveillance in the Pacific region. Livestock plays an important role in the social, cultural and economic environment of Pacific Island communities. Indeed, many of the important social and cultural events in island life cannot be properly carried out without the slaughter and presentation of livestock. With the fast-changing world of science and technology, disease incursions can occur quite unexpectedly New knowledge is therefore being developed to boost animal health and the livestock sector. Disease surveillance is an organized, systematic means of detecting, reporting, recording and analyzing the occurrence of disease based on evidence from the field. Some diseases spread rapidly and cause heavy losses, while other diseases affect or kill humans. There is a need to prevent the spread to avoid further losses and prevent human illness and save lives. Nevertheless, some diseases can be prevented or controlled, thus the need to plan interventions. Compared to other parts of the, the globe, uh, the Pacific region is still re relatively free of uh, serious uh, animal diseases. Eh? And uh, the intention is for, for us to try and maintain it that way. And so for that to be done, we need to have a, a, a good surveillance system within the region. So there is a need for us to train our livestock officers also and uh, our farmers or the whole livestock sector in being able to maintain, if you like, uh, a surveillance system that uh, would detect, uh, diagnose and report any, any animal health issues. A disease is an abnormality of structure or function. An animal has a disease when one or more of its body systems is defective, damaged or incapable of performing its functions. It is therefore important to be able to recognize signs of disease so that a sick animal can be treated or quarantined quickly, the spread of disease to other animals can be prevented and an outbreak of new diseases can be recognized quickly. Some of the things that we need to, 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 to develop in the region uh, is more consideration for animal welfare, animal welfare issues. Um, I think if you go anywhere in the region, you'll find that there's a great need for that, eh? and how we handle animals and manage animals. There is also a need for us to manage the, the, the interaction between livestock uh, production systems and the environment, uh, including waste management. The Animal Health and Production Team at the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, SBC, works together with national government agencies and interested parties in the Pacific region to develop prosperous, efficient and sustainable animal health and production systems. One of the main objectives of the Pacific Regional Influenza Pandemic Preparedness Project, PRIP, was to strengthen the diagnostic capacity of the animal health sector in Pacific Island countries and territories to address the increasing need for early diagnosis of animal diseases. I was recruited as um, animal regional animal health specialist under the, the PRIP project, uh, which basically means uh, 
Pacific Regional Influenza and Pandemic Preparedness Project. Uh, and the task I was uh, uh, to do was to develop the um, country capacity in terms of animal health capacity in countries uh, within SPC member countries to respond to emerging diseases. In this case, bird flu, basically, it was the emphasis. Um, other than that, is also to provide technical advices uh, and also to, also to coordinate uh, any regional responses in terms of disease occurring in some of the member countries. There are two broad types of surveillance that are currently being used. Passive surveillance is the use of traditional reporting systems such as compulsory disease outbreak notifications or the use of laboratory submission data. Active surveillance, on the other hand, is the use of structured disease surveys of a relatively small, representative sample of the population to gather specific information about that population. Basically, there, there are two types of uh, surveillance systems. Eh? One is uh, passive and the other one is an active uh, surveillance system. Passive is, is, is where you, you, you wait and you, and you, and you uh, you respond to reports from farmers or communities of, of any abnormalities. Eh? Whereas an active surveillance system is where you actually go out and establish, establish a system where you, where you continue, continuously monitor the animal health uh, situation out there in the field, in the environment. And then you collect and uh, assess the, the data that you, uh, that, that you collect. Uh, that, of course, uh, would need resources. Eh? Uh, whereas the passive, the passive uh, system, you just, you just wait for reports to come in. The key to success in handling animal disease epidemics is early detection. If a disease can be detected very early in the phase of a potential epidemic development, the possibility exists that it can be arrested and eliminated before it actually inflicts major losses and damage to the sector. Surveillance and early detection is the primary key to effective disease management. The other thing in surveillance system is public awareness, yeah. We really need to get to the public and, and, and train the farmers and community in terms of disease recognition. It means basically it's training, simple training for village people, or maybe leaders or, or some youth in how to identify. If you see a disease sign, you can, you can guess what it might be and report it to authorities so the authorities can come in, you know. So if, if uh, public doesn't know, they can help you. As far as diseases are concerned, the region is free from a lot of the major animal health diseases that spread and affect other areas of the world. However, the loss of production caused by livestock diseases and the risk of humans being exposed to diseases carried by animals are major concerns for the development of the livestock sector in Pacific Island countries. Ease of travel both by air and by sea is exposing us to new, uh, new risks in terms of disease introductions. The green iguana example here in Fiji, where this iguana was brought into Fiji, it's now, now established, it threatens our own uh, uh, unique iguanas, is a good example of, uh, of this happening, but it can happen in many, many other ways. For example, avian influenza, foot and mouth disease, and so on. So these uh, risks, these threats are very real, they're, they're increasing, and this underlines the importance of having a competent uh, para-veterinary service or animal health uh, technician service. According to Dr. Yarrow, one of the most important contributions that animal health staff in the region can make is to ensure that this favorable animal health status is maintained. To do this, 
He says it is important that people who work in the livestock sector are alert to the possibility of an exotic animal disease when an unusual incident occurs. Well, animal disease surveillance is, uh, is critical with the uh, increasing movement of people and uh, products across the region. Not only just the recognized movement, but you have the informal movement through uh, smuggling and uh, fishing vessels which are out in the outer islands and often uh, share some of their food with the islanders and there's real risks there of uh, disease introduction. So it's more important to have uh, early warning systems developed for uh, surveillance. The Pacific region encompasses one-third of the world's surface area, and this vastness and extensive borders offer huge challenges to efforts to monitor incursions of transboundary animal diseases. It is therefore essential that national and regional preparedness efforts are strengthened to enable us to respond effectively to the threat of transboundary animal diseases. At the moment, what we are doing now is <coughs> this is surveillance in cattle that uh, Brucella, Brucella, Brucella testing and the tuberculosis testing. So in Brucella and tuberculosis testing, we usually collect blood and then send it to the lab and then we usually do two tests, okay? The serum, serum agglutination test and, uh, it's more, uh, and the other one is the ELISA testing. And for the tuberculosis testing, we usually do the uh, tuberculin tests. It is a very important, uh, probably uh, one of the most important uh, workshops that I have ever seen been conducted to the staff of uh, not only the Ministry, but especially to the Division of Animal Health and Production. I think it's uh, one of the best workshop, workshop that uh, I have attended to. And uh, it's uh, very helpful in my field of work regarding in uh, combat uh, any disease outbreak uh, in the country or within the maritime zone. While the workshop was described as a great success, there were also calls to have an early warning system developed for surveillance to be part of a wider regional service. We need to have a regional response uh, system in place, you know, because um, we can train people in bigger countries and uh, they can be put, but the small countries will still re remain to, to rely on SPC. And SPC, I, to me personally, and I think we have been talking about, is to have a regional response and also a regional surveillance system. Humans are really all part of the animal kingdom and we should uh, perhaps look more seriously at uh, the way we treat animals, the way we handle animals. They're very important to us and uh, I think we need to give them more, more respect and recognition. That's perhaps my parting uh, comment, uh, Emily. The expectation from uh, our, our, like our clientele, our, our, our farmers or pet owners, uh, is very high now with, with, the, with the growing income, uh, surplus income with, 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 with our communities. So they, they demand the highest level of uh, attention paid to companion animals and farmers and, and, and farm animals. And so we need to meet those expectations with, uh, with uh, professionally qualified uh, veterinarians. Eh? Uh, that, that is one issue. The other issue is, uh, like I mentioned, public health issues. Where we need to address uh, public health issues at, at the animal source, whether it be diseases, or the, the products that humans have to, to consume. And so, if, if you like, it's, it's a protection um, buffer mechanism that we, 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 uh, we need to, a uh, role that we need to play. Animal disease surveillance is critical with the increasing reality of incursion of exotic pests and diseases as a result of the increasing movement of people and products across the region. There is a need to have a more sufficient recognition of the important role of livestock and the need to review policies and practices that support livestock production.
the SBC will continue to play a major role in the livestock sector in years to come. Ultimately, the onus is on everyone, governments and communities, to seriously pay more attention to our livestock and the way we treat and handle our animals. Welcome back, you're watching The Pacific Way. Our next short film provides a sobering insight into the impact of climate change on water and health. This piece, filmed in Kiribati, was produced by participants during a media and climate change workshop conducted by SBC and supported by the Global Climate Change Alliance, Pacific Small Island States. Let's take a look. Bob Soram is a 55-year-old retired contractor. He has lived in the Michael for 12 years. For him, climate change is that he can't drink from his well because the water is salty. Bob also knows that coastal erosion is caused by climate change. Kiribati has felt the impact of climate change through various means, such as environment, health, fisheries, and other social aspects. When the climate changes, when the temperature around the world gets warmer, um, the sea starts to rise with the ice melting from the land running into the sea and the sea gets um, bigger when it's warm. So um, that's a problem, sea level rise. And also it affects the rain, how often it rains. Uh, we're expecting Kiribati to get wetter with climate change. It already has started. When it's wetter, there's more risk about mosquitoes um, that carry dinghy fever and other diseases. So all these things are linked together and that's why climate change is a problem. Water is now the major problem to Kiribati people. The, the water problems related to climate change that we are already seeing in Kiribati include that of uh, Freshwater wells are now being observed as getting more and more brackish and not coming suitable for consumption. Yeah? A lot of the activities that are, that are being done with regards to water are mostly you know, with uh, improving or ensuring that the water supply for the communities are maintained. And especially on South Tarawa, the, the more intact water lands are being extracted more and more like in Bondriki and uh, Bota. The current plans are that 
I mean, the government is, is currently looking at other options, including the uh, water desalination. But of course, these are very resource intensive and the government sees it as as just an option. But whether we go into that is depends really on what the resources are for the future. Okay? Water is life to people in Kiribati and safe drinking water is therefore critical. Likely impact of climate change on water in terms of health in Kiribati is that it will increase the risk of waterborne diseases leading to illnesses such as diarrhea through contamination of water supplies, intrusion of salt into water supplies and by affecting the reliability or security of water supplies in Kiribati. So while we can't say for certain exactly what will happen with water, what we do know is that the safety and security of the supply of water in Kiribati is likely to be compromised or less reliable. So we need to be extra cautious and extra careful about protecting ourselves from the risks of waterborne diseases. The impacts of climate change on clean and safe drinking water must never be forgotten. For people like Bob, safe drinking water determines healthy people and healthy Kiribati. Bob is one of the people who knows about climate change. What about you and me? Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but do pay us a visit on Facebook and on YouTube. We'd love to know your thoughts about the show or any of our stories. Until next time, tofa soifua nisa mwade.